Dear students, let us start the discussion related to the 16 February 2016 newspaper. Now, what is a university? What it has to cultivate into the minds of the students is the central article over here by the Kalpana Kannabiran. Here, if you take the discussion, it was written in the context of the use of uh, Anti-Sedition Act against the JNU students. So here, an anti-sedition law is meant for altogether a different use and it has come during the colonial era. Now in this case, it is more and more used to quell the dissent and debate which is against the government. So in this scenario, let us try to understand the space the universities has to provide for. Universities are meant for dissent, questioning and developing something called critical reasoning. So here the challenge is how to facilitate through and how to ensure that this dissent will be constructive and will not take the form of a violence and facilitate the social transformation. So here the entire university administration shall act as a trustee to the students and their growth rather than acting as the agents of government towards quelling their dissent. So the JNUs, whatever is happening over there is majorly can be seen as the high handedness of the government in the university affairs. So there appears to be a pattern with regard to what is happening in the universities. The University of Hyderabad, JNU, and Allahabad University, everywhere there appears a pattern with regard to the things happening in the universities. So, it can be clearly said, the sanctity of the university as a space for critical dissent and reason has to be protected towards the progress of our democracy. And any social transformation, the ideas of justice, fundamental interrogations into freedoms, everything flows from these intellectual spaces and they have wider implications for the society at large. Now coming to the sedition law and now section 124A it was not there initially in the Indian Penal Code proposed in 1860 later it was introduced. Now in this context if you see how the sedition law was used before independence Mahatma Gandhi Prime Minister, first Prime Minister of India Nehru Everyone are the victims of the use of this sedition law. Later it was continued, even after the independence. There was a strong opposition from the various leaders of the country then. Prime Minister Nehru himself believed that sedition law is fundamentally against the constitution. However, the concerns of the public order, which are the art, part of the Article 19 sub clause 2, has provided for a reasonable restrictions on the freedom of speech and expression. In this context, in protection of the public order, sedition law has continued its existence. Way back in 1942 itself, the relevance of the sedition law was questioned. So at that point of time, Justice Maurice Gwire, what he said is this, it is not just um, making of a speech, a connection of the speech with an event that causes the violence uh, or that may cause the violence is necessary to frame a person under the anti-sedition charges. But however, he failed to give a framework um, how to put it into action. The Supreme Court of India in Kedar Nadh, Singh vs. State of Bihar upheld what is given by Gwair in uh, 1942 and said, it is not just uttering a word that leads to anti-sedition. It shall lead to a disorderliness and violent action that has to lead to sedition. So finally with this, it is the time India has to protect its freedom of speech and expression and it has to facilitate the repeal of the article, the section 124A of IPC that is critical to the freedom of speech and expression. India is a progressive liberal constitution because of its freedoms. In this context, these limitations on the freedoms has a demeaning effect on the growth of an individual to his fullest potential. Now coming to the banking sector and reforms, there are two things. 
Now, riskless capitalism is the term used by Raghuram Rajan, Governor Raghuram Rajan, to explain how the business is conducted in India. Now, when the days are good, then all the profits are enjoyed by the big corporates. Now, when the days are bad, that is leading to the mounting of non-performance assets of the banks. It means the risk is on the banks, public sector banks, and the benefits are to the corporate houses. So in this context, now there is a clear nexus between the business, bankers, auditors, politicians, etc., which is leading to bleeding of the public sector banks. Now I am decluttering all this uh, statistical data over here. Only we can remember that um, the stress assets of the banks today are around the 8.47 lakh crore rupees, um, which forms to the tune of 6.7% of the India's GDP, which is close to a crisis situation. So how we shall handle this? Um, so we need to develop a strong legal framework um, by curtailing all the loopholes which provide for this business and banker nexus to weaken the banking sector or to pay play to their whims and fancies. So till then, any bailout or restructuring of the bad debts have to be stopped. And the second thing is that developmental financial institutions, they saw a very immature death in India. From 1990 to 2005, you see all the developmental financial institutions lost their existence. At the same time, Japan, Germany, Brazil, you can see their uh, relevance now. So, here the long term debt uh, or the long term capital assurance for the infrastructure, etc., previously was the responsibility of these developmental financial institutions. Bringing it under the scope of the banking sector has further worsened the scenario. So, re-establishing the developmental financial institutions can be a solution. Now, again, the government shall act as a owner of a bank or an investor of a bank is the question. Now, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley two days back has said that government will not interfere with the management of the banks and it will be professionally managed by its board of directors. If you carefully observe the Nayak committee, what it said is by observing the board meetings of the public sector banks. So the relative time they spend on financial inclusion and many other matters is very less compared to the private sector banks. The reason is they believe most of these decisions belongs to the government of the day. And any failure they attribute it to the government of the day. So in this context, autonomy to the banks is very much important to make them responsible. So, the government has to maintain its arm length distance. For that, it can constitute a holding company where all its shares of the banks can be put in place. And this, has, this holding company will be professionally managed. So, this is going to behave more as an investor rather than a owner. This is very much in close to the NIAX committee recommendations. So these changes have to be brought in to make the banking sector viable again in India. Coming to the Raghuram Rajan. So now, there are many questions in the minds of the students this way. If China and Japan devaluing the currency, why can't India do that? So the cheaper currency will lead to the growth of the exports. Now, you need to connect all the Raghuram Rajan's thoughts. The first what he said is, it is not for... Make in India, it has to be make for India. It means local demand has to be created for grow, for products and substances. And the second thing is, once we do that, we have to work towards the export-led growth. If you see the South Korea, China, Japan, all these were centered around the export-led growth. So for them, this uh, cheap currency has really worked. But today's problems these countries are facing can be attributed to the same policy of the cheap currency. India shall learn from their failures and instead of that it has to develop its local market, local uh, uh, production and finally once it has been reached to its uh, janith, it has to focus on the other markets too. It means uh, there have may, uh, that is export led growth and growth led export uh, both of them go hand in hand in India rather than depending only on the export led growth. 
from this perspective the cheap currency the, through uh, weakening of the rupee has its own undesirable effects which in long run will affect the economy and india is not in favor of this never miss a chance again repeatedly we are seeing the multiple articles so with regard to the fiscal deficit what the author says is instead of widening the fiscal deficit target the finance minister shall go for consolidation of it through disinvestment and rationalizing of the subsidies that is what is the essence of the article and coming to the maritime silk road the disbauti myanmar and sri lanka these are becoming the new horns or new uh, pearls with regard to the maritime silk road so the china's major policy is to bypass the straits of malacca where the united states of america sixth fleet has its presence so now so recently hamban thutta the prime minister vikram singh has said it they will not be awarding it for china's uh, development uh, but however finally sri lanka appeared to be giving away that and already we know from gwadar to kashgar economic corridor in patru pakistan and disbauti and also with regard to the kwampu i am unable to spell out this name kwai kufu in myanmar this can improve the situation or this provide for important notes with regard to the maritime silk road of china and next is this is a controversy with regard to the judicial hierarchy now a supreme court has transferred um, one of the judges of the uh, that is karnan justice karnan of madras high court um, so then he himself has given an order staying his transfer and uh, asked the supreme court not to intervene in his jurisdiction so this brings in uh, so the transfers etc into question again and what is the control of the supreme court on the high court um, high court some um, and what is the authority and mechanisms that have to be devised for the discipline judiciary and transfer of the judges now you see the net neutrality debate it has brought in a new dimension to the public policy making that is an effective consultation with the stakeholders now the people believe that their voice do matter in the public policy so in this context the sham benegal committee was appointed on the central board of film certification in its revamp so the recent moral policing on the movies has to be done away with so the deadpool a germs but the new james bond movie was sent to critical censoring so another online movement has started and they started recommending the suggestions from the people to the sham benegal committee so it makes the people's voice more heard over here that makes the things different towards the public policy making and e governance and internet as a tool towards articulation of the in interest between the government and the citizens is the showing its scope of action now which is good for the country thank you very much all the best